today we continue our series, It Is Written. We're looking at the prophecies about the coming of Jesus that Matthew places in the beginning of his gospel. And so last weekend we covered the prophecy about Emmanuel, this name given to the Messiah that means God with us. That no longer is God just above us, now he's with us. Today, we're going to move right on through, get to the next section here with a whole new prophecy. Now, there's a lot packed in here that we've got to break down. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read the whole thing first, and then we'll, we'll break it down. So it starts Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It'll be on the screens uh, if you don't have a Bible with you. If you do, that's where it's at. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold... Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he said to Bethlehem, saying, sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And so the first thing that jumps off the page to me here is simple. Jesus is king. The Magi show up right away, and what's the question that they ask Herod? Where's the one who was born king of the Jews? Where's the king? They ask King Herod, hey, where's the king? Can you help us find him? And now note, the way that they phrase this question doesn't mean, where's the child who has been born who one day is going to be the king of the Jews? The way they ask this question is, where is the child who by nature of his existence is king of the Jews, who was born king? See the difference? See, somewhere in our country right now, there exists a five-year-old or something that one day will be president. Have you ever thought about it that way? There's like some little snotty-nosed kid that one day is going to have the nuclear launch codes, all right? It's kind of weird to think about. But here's the thing is nobody is really going to try to figure out who that kid is now. Like, Nate Silver's good, but he's not that good, right? Like, we don't know who this kid is, and no one's really that concerned with trying to find out. Because, sure, it's an important job that one day they're going to have, but like, we've got a lot of things we've got to figure out now. Like, who's going to be president next year? Like, we've got to answer that question first. We don't really care about this kid. If we did know, then maybe it'd be something, if it was a slow news day, they'd be like, hey, let's interview the future president kid. Like, how's math going? You know, like... <laughs> but it wouldn't, there wouldn't be like intense like, care about this. We've got bigger fish to fry. But this child is already... King, if you've read feudal history or maybe read or watched fiction about knights and kings and all that sort of stuff, you know that the king is, okay, the king's the king, and then his firstborn son has the birthright to be king after him, but he's got to wait for his dad to die or go away or something before he gets to be king. He's not just born, no one's born king. All kings at some point exist for a time when they were not the king. But this child's different. He's already king. By nature of existence, he is king of the Jews. 
And of course, it's not the only king that Matthew mentions here. He points out specifically that Herod is king. He calls him Herod the king. In fact, the Roman government used to call Herod the king of the Jews. And so you can see why a conflict might arise here. Now, Herod was a half-Jew. He was made king of Judea around 40 B.C. And he outwardly practiced Judaism, but it was really, it seems, just to kind of placate the people following him. Realistically, he didn't hold that faith very dearly at all. A political figure pretending to hold a specific religion to garner favor from the public. It's a good thing we don't have to deal with that anymore, right? Now, there were some positives about Herod. He was a great builder. He was the one who built the temple in Jerusalem after it had been destroyed, the first one. He built it, and he wanted to make it as grand as possible. He wanted to just go all out, just do something crazy. The problem was he was limited by the dimensions in the Old Testament because he had to, he wanted, okay, I'm going to make this big, bold, beautiful temple, but if I do anything that doesn't follow the direction Solomon was given, people aren't going to like it. So he was trying to ride this balance of, okay, well, how do I follow that, but then also make it just like really baller? And so what he decides to do is we'll make the temple itself right to exact specification. But God never said anything about what the temple mount had to look like. And so you've got this temple that sits in the middle of this gigantic temple mount. It's just absolutely huge and walls built up and the whole thing. It was so big that scholars for a long time thought that Josephus' descriptions of it were exaggerations. Like, there's no way this is real. And then they excavated it and went, oh, this is real. This is gigantic. And you can kind of see it now. There's an interesting thing in the Bible software I've got where they have these new maps that are sort of like the Bible lands then and now. And so you can take like a, your cursor and kind of like wipe back and forth and see like, Here's what Herod's temple looked like. Now here's what it looks like now, today. And so you can see, like, Herod's temple was huge and everything was built up, and now it's all mostly torn down, and there's the uh, Muslim building, the Dome of the Rock, that sort of sits in that spot now. But it's much smaller than everything else. He went big. It had so much gold on the outside of it that it's said to have blinded people when they looked at it. It was said... By the Jews of this temple, no one has seen a truly beautiful building unless he has seen the temple. So he did that. That was good. He was a shrewd diplomat, too. He was able to maintain peace in Judea, which no one was able to do before him. He was the first guy to really be able to do that. It was said, quote, he was the only ruler of Palestine who ever succeeded in keeping the peace and in bringing order into disorder. That sounds all well, fine, and good. Until you learn about a little bit more about him and about how he kept that peace. <clears throat> See, he kept that peace through oppression and force. He levied heavy taxes against the Jews. He forced them into conscripted labor. Not to mention, the older he got, the crazier he got. And so he grew more and more paranoid. He started killing his sons, killing his wives, killing family members, close associates that he thought were coming after him to take his throne. To be fair, in several cases, they were. But this led Caesar Augustus to make this pun that is sort of every writing about Herod includes this pun because everyone just, all the Greek scholars just think it's awesome. We'll see what you think. Caesar once said that because of this, he would rather be Herod's hoose than his huios, which means he'd rather be his pig than his son. Because, see, the Jews in kosher law, they can't eat pork. So the pig's safe, but he's probably going to kill his son. Look, puns are all over the Bible. It's a godly form of humor. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> and so what we have here is a tale of two kings, Jesus and Herod. And Matthew even sort of contrasts them here. See, what's Jesus going to do? He's going to shepherd his people. What does Herod do? Herod domineers over them. Why is all Jerusalem troubled with Herod? Well, one, it's thought that when it says all Jerusalem, it doesn't mean like every single person that lived in the city. It sort of means the 
elite, uh, top thinkers, leaders. So we're talking those high priests, chief priests, scholars, those sorts of folks. Those are the ones who are troubled with him. Why are they troubled? Because they're afraid of him. When he's not happy, no one's happy. So if he's troubled, you're troubled too. You have no choice. If Herod's not happy, it means bad news for that. Maybe you've worked with somebody like that. They come into the office, they're having a bad day, and it just wrecks it for everyone. Maybe you've had a boss like that. They come in, they just take it out on everybody. And Herod's like that, only he kills people when he gets like that. Your boss might, like, scream and yell or, like, throw something. Maybe he'll fire someone. Uh, he's not going to murder anyone. That's exactly what Herod would do. And now we've seen all sorts of dictators and monarchs throughout history that operated this way. Herod rules and maintains that rule with an iron fist through oppression. He leads from a place of power and wants to flex that. Jesus, on the other hand, is the all-power creator of the universe. God says, let there be light, and Jesus makes it happen. All things are created by him, through him, and for him. And how does he lead? As a shepherd. Now, I don't have sheep. I do have a corgi who actually could do some shepherding of his own. We need to get this guy a job and have him start pulling his weight. But the most important thing with any pet or livestock or whatever is first you've got to feed and water them. You've got to provide for them. You have to care for them in that way. Then second, with sheep, you've got to protect them from animals that want to eat them. They're really easy prey for wild animals. You're not going to see a lot of like sheep fights on YouTube. Like that's just not it's not how they roll. And so they're really easy to kill. And so you've got to take you've got to watch out for them. Keep predators at bay. You see David before he kills Goliath. What does he tell Saul is his credentials? Why chase down lions and bears and kill them when they come after my sheep? Saul's like, oh my. Right? There you go. Take a second. And so you've got to protect them from predators. You've got to protect them from wandering or getting lost. <coughs> Sheep are just going to kind of do what they do. That's why you have, uh, why the corgi exists. Keep those sheep in line. Keep them in a circle. Sheep wander off. Pepe wanders off sometimes too. <laughs> and so just let, you know, I thought it'd be fun to take him out and have him shoveling snow with me because he loves the snow. When it's on the ground, he doesn't love it when it's falling on him. But when it's already there, he loves to play in it. He'll throw it around and stuff. And it's super cute. And so I was like, I'm going to shovel. I'll take Pepe out with me and just not put him on a leash or anything. And that was a terrible idea. Uh, as much as Pepe loves the snow, he also really loves saying hi to other dogs in the neighborhood. And so he was just like, down, yeah, gone. And so you've got to count the sheep. You've got to make sure they stay with the flock. There's a lot of caretaking that comes with shepherding. And that is how we're told that Jesus, the king, is going to rule. Contrast that with Herod. He's more concerned about maintaining his power. He's more concerned about flexing his muscles than actually caring for his people. He's an authoritarian. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus is doing here as shepherd. And so Herod rules through that. He rules through his ambition. He rules through his scheming, right? Right? He didn't get to this place by any means but by plotting it out. Make the right friends, make the right connections, do the right things for the right people, say the right thing. It's all carefully orchestrated to get him to this place of power. And now that he's there, it's carefully orchestrated to keep him in this place of power. That he's got to do more, be more, achieve more. It's all it's this drive for more and more and more. Jesus, again has all the power in the universe, literally. And what does he do? He comes as an infant child. He doesn't have to flex his muscles. He doesn't have to show power. He doesn't have to come with bravado. Instead, he displays weakness. Instead, he displays humility. And so these are qualities that we're called to display. I mean, playing along with the world's game, i got to hide my weaknesses, I can't, let people know that I'm unsure about something. I can't look wishy-washy. I, I can't look like I took in new information and allowed that to change my mind because otherwise I'm a flip-flopper, right? And so I've got to 
just settle on one thing, and no matter how much evidence comes at me that tells me I'm wrong, it's weak for me to change my mind. That's not the humility that Jesus displays here. Sometimes the three hardest words in the English language are, I don't know, right? There's a lot of people that have a hard time just saying, look, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, the smartest people, the truly great people, they have no problem with that. There's actually a whole episode of the Freakonomics podcast about this, where they talk about how difficult it is for people to say, I don't know, and how silly that is, and how counterproductive it is, because then you never learn anything, because you, you start from this place of, well, of course I know. Well, if you were willing to just say, I don't know, and just have that humility, you would actually achieve more and learn more and do more. See, when you're in Jesus, your security is in Him. So your boasting is in Him. Your pride is in Him. And so I don't have to pretend to be better than I am, because who am I trying to impress, right? I'm trying to impress Him. And so I don't have to pretend, oh, okay, i got to put on this front for everyone so that you think that I know what I'm talking about, about everything. You ask me a question, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have to know everything, right? I'm not the expert on everything. I'm not the expert on very much at all, honestly. And so these are qualities that we should be looking to exude ourselves, this humility, being willing to display humility, weakness, lead from that position. Honestly, election season coming up, these are qualities we should be looking for in the leaders that we choose, the leaders that we elect. Are they willing to be humble? Are they willing to say, I don't know? Are they willing to change their mind? Those are things, to me, that make a huge difference if I'm looking at candidates and trying to pick one. We also see in this passage that God has designed this. There are two ways that show his intention and his design here. The first is through prophecy. This whole thing is sort of wrapped around this prophecy here. And that's what this series is all about, is looking at these different prophecies that Matthew pulls out. There's five of them in a row that happen. And seeing, okay, well, what, is, what did that mean back then? What does it mean now? And so this one is wrapped around a verse from Micah chapter 5. Micah 5, verse 2. It says this, it says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is, of, is from of old, from ancient days. So Matthew quotes it in a way that adds a little bit of commentary into it. Kind of like the message translation of the Bible, which is like not really the Bible, it's like the Bible plus Eugene Peterson's thoughts about the Bible. It's a helpful study tool. It's not really a Bible. Uh, and Matthew quotes this verse in a way that he adds a little commentary into it. But what's interesting is what he leaves off. He leaves off the whose coming forth is, of, is from of old, from ancient days. Clearly, Micah means this to be about the Messiah. And that's why this is the only reference that Matthew uses here in this chunk of these five that he does not say this fulfills that verse. And the reason why is because when Matthew uses the word fulfills, it doesn't mean I said I was going to be here at 3 and then I showed up at 3, I fulfilled that promise. Matthew uses it as it was a promise that was made and then more meaning got filled into it. It got crammed full of new stuff. And this is the one that there's no new stuff for this. Micah meant the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And Matthew just goes, see, happened. And so it's not so much that it's fulfilled, it's just filled. It happened. It came true. And so some people have claimed throughout history, well, Jesus, he just went around, he knew the prophecies about the Messiah, so he just went around and tried to do all those things so people would think he was the Messiah. You can't really control where you're born. Uh, he couldn't have done that one. And sure enough, he's born right here in Bethlehem. And now beyond just this prophecy, God shows his involvement in another way. These cosmic events that happen here. The Magi see some sort of star and it leads them here. Now there's a lot of theories about what that could be. Some people think it was this planetary alignment thing that makes Jupiter look like a star. And apparently there's some astrological meaning to that that related specifically to like Bethlehem and Palestine. But, you know, if you're there, the way it lined up, it would say something that was significant to the Magi in some way. 
So that's one idea. Another idea is there's a supernova that was recorded by Asian astronomers in 5 BC. They think, well, hey, maybe that was it because it lines up right pretty close to the timeline there. Uh, it could have been a supernatural phenomenon. It could have been just God popped a star in and out of existence and that was that. It could have been an angel and not a star at all. And there are many times in Scripture where angels sort of get referred to as stars and that goes back and forth. Uh, the details aren't terribly important, but there's a whole bunch of ideas of what it could be. But what remains the same is that God created this in some way. He orchestrated these events to signify that Jesus had arrived, and he used that event to draw people to him. Now, it's thought that it's possible that the Magi saw this in itself as a prophecy fulfillment. In Numbers 24, it says, this is coming from Balaam. So, a guy with the talking donkey, he prophesies over Israel, and he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out, out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, shall crush the forehead of Moab, and break down all the sons of Sheth. And so there's some scholars that think the Magi were aware of this prophecy, and that there's some evidence that they held Balaam in high regard. And so they sort of put two and two here. What we see through all of this is that God has planned and designed the whole thing. It's no accident. It's not been left to chance. All of this, the coming of King Jesus, has been orchestrated. And so the question then is, how will you respond? For the coming of King Jesus, what does that mean for you? What will you do with that? We see three very different responses here in the text. The Magi have a positive response. Now, these are the least likely people to understand the coming of the Messiah. Who are these guys? Well, most likely, they're wise men or priests from either Persia or Babylon. Now, those guys, they practiced all sorts of magic, but primarily it's this combination of astrology and astronomy. They'd look at the actual stars and then do wacky stuff with it and sort of come up with ideas. And so for that reason, a lot of people think they're Zoroastrians. They come from that cult. These were not good, God-fearing Jews. In hindsight, you can see here, from the very beginning, Matthew's showing, hey, salvation is open to everybody. The whole thing has changed. First, Matthew's like, Jesus, the son of Abraham and the son of David. Why does he mention Abraham? Like, oh, because Abraham was promised that all nations would be blessed through him. Then you go through the genealogy, and what did we see? Every single one of those women that we covered, right? None of them are Jews. We've got, first, we started with Tamar, not a Jew. Rahab, not a Jew. And then who else we got? We got Bathsheba. Not a Jew. Ruth, not a Jew. Like, huh, interesting. Like, right off the bat, Matthew's sort of saying, hey, this is open to everyone. Then who are the first people that come to worship King Jesus? Pagan astrologers. Oh, of course. Like, the first people that show up are wizards from Persia. Like, it totally breaks the mold. They drop everything to go worship Jesus. Just this event in the stars, they're like, we got to pursue this guy. we got to find out what this is about. We're not talking about a quick trip here. This is roughly, give or take, like 550 miles. It's in your car, it's going to take a long time. Walking, man, forget about it. 550 miles. If you were to walk nonstop, 24 hours a day, it would take you over a week just to walk that. And of course, no one's walking nonstop 24 hours. But who knows how long it took a month? took these guys to walk from <laughs> Babylon or Persia over to Bethlehem. You don't do this for nothing, right? It's a big commitment that they make. But they do it, and no one else does. It's just them. And they give sac sacrificially, not just of their time, not just of their energy, but of their treasures. They give Jesus the kind of gifts that you would give a king. They give him gold, they give him aromatics. These are the things you'd bring on a diplomatic mission of some sort. Here they are bringing it to King Jesus. And so they're a great model for us, that we're called to serve the Lord and do it sacrificially. We're, we're called to drop everything and serve Him. And what's interesting too is the Magi get put in danger because of this. They have to be warned in a dream, hey, don't go back to Herod, that's going to go real bad. Go a different way. And so they go the long way home. 
the 550 mile walk was the short way there. They go the long way to avoid Herod. Worshiping Jesus will always be a divisive, dangerous thing to do. Not for the weak. Those opposed sought to harm them. God leads them away. Save them. And now Herod is the reason that they have to flee, and he's the second response, and he has this negative response. Because ultimately, he's threatened by Jesus. What it says he's troubled doesn't really do it justice. He's terrified. He's in turmoil. He's been spending his later years just fighting off challenger after challenger, just trying to shut down everybody that would take the throne from him. And here comes the ultimate challenger. And what does he do? He's desperate to find a way then to try to kill Jesus. And now here's a guy that on the outside, he's trying to look like a good Jew. He builds the temple. He's going through all the motions. You'd think he would be excited about the coming of the Messiah, but he's not, right? His fake faith is completely exposed here. He has to ask, where's the Messiah going to be born? He doesn't know. Look, Jesus left and he said, I'm coming back. You won't know the details until it happens. Peace out, send in the Holy Spirit. Love you. Bye. Right? That's my paraphrase. But I guarantee you this if he told us a specific place, if he was like, I'm coming back in Boulder, Colorado, we would all know that, right? Every single Christian would be like, Where's Jesus coming back? Boulder. Know it. We're heading there now. Like, <laughs> we would all know this. It'd be a huge city. We'd be. Herod doesn't know. Where the Messiah is to be born? They all knew. He asked the chief priest, hey, where's the Messiah going to be born? Bethlehem. They knew. They just quote it right to him. Herod doesn't even know that. He's got to ask somebody else. And see, Herod built this kingdom, and Jesus was coming in. He's going to mess all that up. He's going to dethrone Herod, so Herod wants him killed. Now look, none of us are kings or governors, but we all have a throne in our hearts and minds. And if we're honest, we're a little hesitant sometimes to give our seat to Jesus. That we cling on to control, we cling on to the things we want, we portion off areas of our life and tell God, you get all of this, but I'm going to keep this over here. And what we do when we do that is we tell Jesus, hey, you're in my seat. We're so concerned with holding on to power, holding on to control, that we deny him his rightful place. And now this is not a passive thing to deny Jesus' control. It's an active, negative response to him. It's actively shutting him out and telling him no. That we're not making him the source of our joy. We're not making him our treasure. We're not, none of that. Herod's unwilling to give up his kingdom. And we can't make that same mistake. But the scribes here, they're just as guilty as anyone. They're the third response that we see here. Now, the scribes were basically lawyers back then. That's the easiest way to sort of think about them in an analog that works for us today. They know where the Messiah is born. Here's, where's the Messiah going to be born? Scribes, boom, Bethlehem. They quote the passage to him. They have it memorized, the whole Old Testament. And now, these astrologer, astrologers from the East show up, tell them, hey, the Messiah is here. What do they do about it? Nothing. Nothing. They do nothing. You're not even a little curious. You don't send like one guy with them to make sure it's legit. They sit on their hands and they do nothing. It's baffling how this could be. You've got the Messiah right in front of your face, right in front of your nose, and you do nothing about it. How does that happen? Maybe they're stuck up. Maybe they think, well, these magi think it's happened. Surely it hasn't happened because we know better than them. So they must be wrong. Maybe they're afraid of Herod and they let that dominate. That they're more upset about upsetting, <laughs> they're more worried about upsetting their human king than God Almighty. How do you do this? So many people go through life never picking a side, never settling their thoughts about Jesus, thinking, well, if I'm just a good person, then he'll respect that, and it'll be enough. It's not. It's a deadly mistake. 
there's no mistake about it, a lack of response to Jesus is no different than a negative response to Jesus. It's the same place. He's not going to be impressed by that. And so we have three responses here in the text to Jesus. Which one is yours? Are you like Herod? Are you hostile to him? Are you holding back control firmly, just sort of gripping on to the throne of your heart? Are you like the scribes, presented with an opportunity to serve him and choosing, eh, I'll just wait. Choosing to let the Messiah just pass you by. Or will you be like the Magi, giving Jesus the worship that he deserves, ascribing to him the honor and authority and dignity that is due him, choosing to find your joy and your peace and your happiness in him, opening your treasure, laying it before him, and saying, I want you more than these. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you have come to us and presented us with this opportunity to give you the worship that you are due. Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to be motivated to give you control, to make you our center, to make you our reason, to make you our treasure, that we would choose you over other things, that we would choose you over ourselves that we would choose you over in action. Lord, give us faith. In Jesus' name, amen.